Just, Jill, just give me a thumbs up when you want to start, and then. Okay. Right. I was. We were expecting. We had more registrations, registrants. So I was just giving them a few minutes to um, get online if they had any complications. No, getting out of work is a complication. <laughs> that could be it. Um, I'm just looking at our number of participants. Well, I'll just give you my quick welcome comments. You guys have already started a great conversation, so uh, I don't want to interrupt the flow. I'm Jill Miranda Baker. As you mo most of you know, I'm the executive director here at Keys History and Discovery Center, and I work with the most amazing team with Brad Bertelli, our curator, and Aaron Muir, our manager of events and uh, membership, and our producer and editor, and lots of other things that she's taken on during our uh, virtual time these last too many months. Um, we're really happy that you're here with us tonight as we continue to provide our virtual programs. Um, next week, we have community views, and we're talking about Planter. Yes. Uh, and that is next Wednesday at, six, at five o'clock. And um, enjoy your conversation tonight. I look forward to listening in. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jill. All right. So uh, with the, the vast number of, well, here we got some more people coming on now. Excellent. Um, so Peter, if you have any questions, just feel free to, to, to ask away or Mary Jo usually is, is good for a handful of questions. Thanks. This is my first time, so I don't I don't know how these work. You can just it's just a an hour long us talking about whatever you want to talk about, and if you and I'll do my best to answer any question that's uh, that's available or that, that's posed. Um, Ellen, thank you. Hi, hi, Ellen. She's joined us. You're on mute, Ellen. You're on mute. Oh, sorry, I was a little late. That's all right. <laughs> Ellen has, had asked a couple of a couple of questions she posed um, during the week, and one of the questions that she asked was about Henry Flagler's railroad, and about who who ran the railroad. I believe was one part of your question, and also um, it had gone bankrupt, so it was actually going out of business prior to the 1935 Labor Day hurricane. But she had a question as to why it was losing money correct correct all right so the first part of your question it was part of the east coast railway system so it was actually the key west extension of of the east coast railway that you know went all along the east coast uh and then with its final destination at key west although the final destination of the railroad was actually havana because when the train would would arrive at Key West, it would be loaded onto an automobile ferry, which would also could would hold the railroad cars. And they would go from Key West to Havana, and then they would be loaded up with produce and other goods, and then shipped back to to Key West, and and then shipped up up the East Coast to you know Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Maryland, and then you know off to Chicago and other markets. Now part of the problem for the East Coast Railway was in 1929, a competing railroad called C-Train uh, started working and they, were, they would pull into New Orleans and then ships could you know, come into port in New Orleans and then again, take, take the goods to you know, Chicago and the same, the same markets along the railroad train, railroad tracks. But because of, because of the section the boat, the automobile ferry and the railroad car ferry between Key West and, and Havana, it was subject to an additional tax from the, uh, from the um, whoop, I can't remember the name. I thought I told myself I would remember the name and I didn't. So let me, I hit my note, the Interstate Commerce Commission. So they had to pay a higher tax than C, than C train. And, C, and they eventually could not compete with C-Train. And then their, their, their shipping line kind of just went that down and down and, and continued to lose money. So by the time the 1935 hurricane comes around and destroys the, the 40 miles of, of railroad track, 
it had already been a losing cooperation, uh, uh, losing um, operation, and was headed for ultimate bankruptcy anyways. So I, so the hurricane really just kind of, you know, ended what was already a dying enterprise. All right. Okay. Thanks. You're you're welcome. Hey, how do I get my face off of this thing? Well, I don't know you. Have a nice face. <laughs> <laughs> point that at, at a pretty picture on the wall or something you okay. can ellen you can go to the bottom of your screen and where it says start video or yeah. stop video just yeah. click on that and you'll you'll go uh -huh. away and there you're gone there you go good i look a lot better <laughs> that way okay thanks robert welcome and donna welcome to the conversation if you have any questions just go ahead and and uh Shout them out, or and we and we will address those. Who were the, who were the first settlers out on Indian Key? In in American American, in terms of America, uh, of this becoming part of America, uh, with the, with the signing of the Adams Onis Treaty, which was finished in 1821, which um, which acquired the, the Florida Territory, which included the Florida Keys and also the Florida Reef. From Spain, um, the first, and so I'm going to use that as as a benchmark. And the first like resident that, that is documented really is a man named Silas Fletcher, who yeah. arrived uh, 1824. He was hired by two gentlemen who had formed a small wrecking community, a community of their own, a very small wrecking village, on um, Knights Key, Key, the Key Vaca area, or Marathon. And that was Solomon Snyder and Joshua Appleby. And they hired uh, Silas Fletcher to uh, go to Indian Key and to construct a general store, not just construct a general store, but to operate a general store. And that was 1824. Fletcher brought his wife and two children, also had a partner named Joseph Prince, who helped him construct the, the uh, general store and, and then became partners in running it. And they built the, a two-story house for the family and that two-story house as well as the business as well as, as the general store would later be purchased by a man named thomas gibson from uh staten island new york area and thomas gibson was actually the brother-in-law for jacob hausman who bought the uh who bought the property um in, in 19, 1828 uh gibson paid $2,500 for the house and the general store from Fletcher. And then, and then he improved the building. He added the billiards tables and nine pin bowling alley, and then moved it from it being a residence to it becoming a hotel. So by 1828, uh, that was operating, that two story building would become oper begin operating as a hotel that would later become the tropical hotel that is so you know, widely talked about on the islands. But they, but Silas Fletcher and his family, and then and Joseph Prince also would be considered the first permanent residents of Indian Key in the American uh, American age. So obviously there was no Facebook, et cetera, to advertise. Have you ever found advertisements saying "Come visit Indian Key"? I mean, Absolutely. because of the hotel, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sounds so good. Yeah, in 1835, the Tropical Hotel is advertised nationally, I think in, in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, I believe, as a, you know, come, come, come to the island, uh, you know, the finest food and, and uh, beverages and, and fare uh, as, as the local, you know, as can be provided by, you know, by the waters and, and whatever, and also advertised as a, a place for, you know, families, for singles, for families. But prior to that, in 1832, um, a man named James Egan, who had formerly lived uh, in the Miami, um, I believe the New River or Fort Lauderdale area, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the New River area or the Miami River area, uh, would come to Indian Key and he would build a two and a half story house um, and he would operate that as a boarding house and advertise that in Key West as a boarding house. And it would be it would be James Audubon who hired Egan, who was a Bahamian descent, descent, as his pilot and guide when Audubon visited the island in, in eighteen in eighteen thirty two. Now, 
um, Egan would not be successful and end up selling that house to Hausman, uh, I believe for $580. And then Hausman would in turn sell that house to Charles Howe for $580. But Hausman being the sport that he was, also sold the property on which the house was on for an additional $580. <laughs> and that house is most remembered as the Dr. Perrine house, which is where, which is where Dr. Perrine uh, lived when, and his family between Christmas Day, 1838, and, uh, and uh, August 7th, 1840, when the attack occurred. Huh. I always find it interesting. I, I presume, obvi obviously, everybody had to travel by boat to arrive at the island, but I wondered if there was some mainland destination that was the jump off point, you know, come to the Tropic Hotel. You well, know, it was, they, definitely, it was definitely was advertised because of the favorable climate, you know. Right. And, and it, was a, it was advertised as a place for invalids to come and in, like, you know, people with, with respiratory problems, you know, to, to get away from the cold, which is kind of the reason that Henry Prime ends up there because he, had been affected by a, by malaria and never quite and and then uh, but he'd also been affected as he drank arsenic and had poisoning which had permanently uh, had you know caused him health issues and when it was warm he was okay but every time the weather got colder he would begin to suffer again his health would suffer which is why he went from you know from the Midwest and from New York um, first to Louis to uh, Mississippi I believe or Louisiana and then down to down to uh, Campeche in, in, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And then he wanted to stay in warmer climates because his health was better in the warmer climates. Was he a botanist? He was a, a, a bot, he was, yes, a, like a self-taught botanist. He was, always, he was a doctor by, by study, a medical doctor. Medical. But he also, he always had a penchant for plants that were growing around him. And whenever he went to a new place, he would always look at what was around, what was growing around, and what the locals, what both the Indians and also the local people used for their, you know, for their, for their medicine, for medical purposes, what kind of plants they used. So he was already really involved in, in, in plants, even when uh, the president, you know, issued this command or this, this directive to all the, the hundred people who had, had taken these, these positions as, as U.S. consuls around, around, the, around the world to begin to document what plants might be considered favorable for this burgeoning America that was, that was beginning to grow. Which, and he was the only one who really you know, took it seriously and, and took copious notes and began sending these samples of you know, seedlings, seed samples and, 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 and uh, plant samples you know, up back to the United States for, for further study. Huh. Where was his plantation on the mainland where he did the experimental planting? It never, the Tropical Plant Company was supposed to be in a area today called Perrine, Florida, named for him. Um, it's around, oh, there is a, a historic structure there, a, 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 kind of a, a big, a, a big uh, historic, uh, the names are, it's below Kendall, above Homestead, Oh, okay. Color Ridge, the Color Ridge area. Oh. That that's where it was supposed to have been. It never, you know, that the, they were waiting for the for the, the the second escalation of the Seminole War to die down before he, you know, moved his operation back up to, or, or up to the mainland. And he had a a, a temporary a, a nursery on Lower Matacumbi Key, which is where he was had begun to grow to grow some of the plants. And interestingly, when his son uh, Henry Prine Jr. revisited the island um, in 1870, I believe, right around that area. The only plants that had that he planted, the only two that had really survived, were the Sicil agave and also some key lime trees. The only ones that he, that he noticed still that, that were still growing from what his father had planted. Hmm. Thanks. What? Was, I know Goodyear had been out there. Was he out there at the same time that Perrine was there? Was there some interaction between the two of them? Absolutely. And, it was, and after the attack, it was, um, not everybody abandoned the island after the attack on 18, August 8, 7th, 1840. True, the military would, would move their um, naval depot from Tea Table Key 
back to Indian Key, but Charles Howe and his family, as well as the Goodyear family, also remained on the island and didn't leave for, for quite a while. And the Goodyears uh, actually ran a little grog shop on one of the, on one of the wharfs, a little general, a little grog shop to, you know, to serve those thirsty sailors who are in need of a little inter entertainment. But they were there. There was a, um, a, a, an outbreak of yellow fever in 18, I believe 1840, 1841. Mm -hmm. And at least one or two members of the, uh, I want to say Amasa Goodyear, I believe that's the name that comes to mind, died. I think he was the father of died of, of, of yellow fever. Mm -hmm. And Goodyear is, is, is the Goodyear. It, it, that's the family of the Goodyear tires. It was one of the other sons who, you know, of, who uh, 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 patented the vulcanization of rubber that would lead to many things as well as Goodyear tires, which is still very well known today. Did Goodyear, I mean, was it just rumor or was it just fable that Goodyear had plants there as well? Were there, I, I don't think it was rubber trees. Yeah, I don't, I think that, I don't know if that's true. Um, that's probably one of those things that because Goodyear and rubber trees kind of get, get, get kind of clumped in together. I've never read anything about rubber trees on Indian Key. Um, so I, not that, Peter, have you ever heard, heard of that? No, I haven't heard of, of rubber trees, and they didn't come up again until World War II when the country sent people to uh, a, a whole, when, when the United States government sent people to a number of countries around the world to try and protect, grow and protect rubber as a strategic uh, defense material. Hmm. This is that, uh, Peter J J Jutro? Jutro. Jutro, ignore Jutro. the J. <laughs> <laughs> he is an expert on lignum vitae key and is currently working on a book about lignum vitae key. Oh, how so wonderful. He is, uh, we're thrilled to have him join us today. And he was going to uh, give a lecture on lignum vitae key during our 2020-2021 lecture series. We're really happy about that. That'd be fantastic. Yes. Yeah, that'll be wonderful. wonderful. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Huh. All right. Have you been out to uh, Indian Key since Irma? Me? Yeah. Several times, yeah. I've been out there probably 10 times since Irma. It's still, uh, it's been quite, there's still lots of damage. Um, I won't say damage, but you can still see that it's not quite the same island that it once was. Um, all of the P rock, especially on the, um, Atlantic facing side of the island, all of those trails that had once been, you know, kind of covered in P rock, make it more manageable to walk on, was all washed away. Oh. So now it's more um, just the limestone substrate and, you know, this series of, of, of tree roots, and, you know, that you have to kind of walk, have to be careful walking around. One of the saddest things about the hurricane and the dock, which was destroyed in, in Irma, still has not been repaired. So, so it's still, it's still, you know, only accessible by kayak or by a small boat if you want to kind of anchor off and, and kind of wade in. But at the warehouse, at, at the warehouse structure, which, which was actually two buildings, there was a one feature in the, if you're looking at the warehouse, the, the lower left-hand corner of it, which was kind of a, a bathroom feature. There's a little doorway there because uh, it kind of, um, it was kind of basically a well that flushed twice a day with the rise and fall of the tide and part of, uh, one of the things that happened during Irma was all this sand and debris got pushed over the warehouse and kind of filled that hole up about halfway up which was really that was all the way down to the water so you could see you know so at low at you know at high tide there was there was water in the bottom of it and there was a bunch of a couple of crabs crawling around as well um but that that has been covered up which which was really a which I, I was really sad to see where did they get the water for Indian Key when, when people were living there? Um, one of the reasons the Indian Key was such a, such a great location and had been used by, by Spanish, you know, by, by European sailors from the 15th century was that on Lower Matacumbi Key, um, I'm sorry, 16th century, not 15th, 1500, 16th century, um, 
on Lower Matacumbi Key in kind of what the area of what is the uh, Robbie's Marina parking lot today, there were five freshwater wells that were each about four, about four feet deep. And they were considered by in, in, in some historical uh, resources to be the most reliable source of fresh water in all of the Florida Keys. Wow. And so that was, and that was not the only, there was also, when you read through like Perrine's, uh, some of the diaries from, from, from the children and some of the other things, there was also a, a second uh, freshwater well um, or a freshwater source different from there, the Ferry Grotto, which, which, which he talks about, where Perrine uh, has, which is kind of near where his, um, his, uh, his temporary, planta her, her temporary plantation was, um, was also a, a source of fresh water that is no longer there. No one knows where it was. Uh, but um, and then and then Henry Prime. So that that was the prime the primary source of fresh water. So it was a very convenient way to go over there, fill up their cask, and bring them back. Of course, during during as more and more people lived on the island, one you know beneath the houses there were always uh, cisterns that were constructed with a you know with a system of of um, of uh, gutters you know with a, you know a, a steeple roof and, and gutters that would that would collect the rainwater and empty in, into the into the uh, into the uh, the cisterns. Now today there are two kinds of cisterns on the island that, that are still visible. Two of the, the different kinds of ruins. There are the square cisterns, and then there's there's uh, three round cisterns that, that are still visible. And the square cisterns were all built prior to the Indian attack, attack of August 7th, 1840. Those were all built pre before the attack. The round cisterns, which are still there today, those were constructed um, after the attack when the military adopted Indian Key as their naval depot. So the, those three were all military built post, you know, 1840, 1841. So by, eight, so by 1841, there's one of those cisterns will take 20,000 gallons, held 20,000 gallons. So they, they were re really significant uh, resource water. There was also a, a, a cistern that, um, during construction of one of the warehouse buildings, Housman paid a a um, a uh, granite uh, a, a, a masonry guy to come down from New York, and for four thousand dollars built another large cistern in the uh, beneath one of the one of the um, uh, uh, warehouse yeah. which is where um, several people hid during the Indian attack, and one of the young boys. There were three people hiding there, you know, according to some of the first-hand documentation, and two of the men escaped as it, the warehouse was lit on fire, and they escaped with, you know, kind of, you know, singed and 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 burned a little bit. But there was also a, a boy that was, um, like Chris, hey Chris, there was also a boy that um, that didn't that didn't manage to escape and succumbed to some of the, uh, you know, smoke inhalation, and then was kind of, you know, basically boiled alive. Down in, in, inside in, inside the warehouse. Yeah. Welcome, Chris, my friend Chris from Maryland. Maryland? No. No, I'm sorry, North, North Carolina. There you go. <laughs> sorry, I'm late working tonight. You what? You're working. So, sorry, I was late. I'm, I was working tonight. All right. Well, welcome. What did I miss? Uh, we were talking about Flatters Railroad. Talking a little bit about. Uh, about Indian Key and freshwater sources in, you know, in, in this area. Is there fresh water in Indian Key? Nothing on Indian Key, no. Yeah. But there was some nearby on Lower Matacumbi, kind of where Robbie's, in the parking lot of Robbie's, which was a, a very reliable uh, source of fresh water. And which is why Indian Key became so important in, you know, in the early years, because many of these, uh, of these European sailors traveling you know, be between, um, you know, down the, the Florida Straits would could stop at at Indian Key. Granted, the the large the large you know uh, galleons and, uh, and, and and big ships could not make it to Indian Key, but some of the smaller auxiliary ships were. There was a, a good access um, from Hawks Channel to the island, which had a, a fairly deep uh, natural harbor, and from that point they could take the you know, smaller longboats, skiffs, basically. To uh, Lower Matacumbi with uh, barrels to fill up their their you know caskets full of fresh water there. 
Is there any Are, private ownership of the Indian Key at all? Or is it I'm just state-owned? Is the entire Indian Key state-owned? I mean, obviously it went through Hausman and, you know, different individuals. But It was never, um, had never been purchased prior to it becoming a, an American property. Um, where uh, Key West had been purchased during Spanish, you know, ownership. Uh, Duck Key had been, uh, Long Key, several, uh, there were several smaller islands, Vaca Key, had been purchased prior to it becoming an American, American, American owned, American, you know. And so those kind of fell under what are called the, um, oh, uh, Spanish homestead rights. I can't think of the word about, off the, I can't phrase it off the top of my head. But those could be sold if you proved that you owned the island before it became an American property, you retained ownership of it. Any island that, or property that, had not, that could not be proved to be owned, previously owned uh, by somebody uh, prior to it becoming an American property became part of you know, state or government owned. So Indian Key was, had always been government owned. So all these people who were buying and selling property on Indian Key had really just been squatters. And when, and for instance, when um, when Hausman attempted to sell Indian Key to the to the government um, after the attack, to uh, you know they basically thanked him for for all his work on you know and build and, and building the wharves and the warehouses and, and and the cisterns, but he had never he had just been a squatter. The first paper trail, the first like real ownership of Indian Key was actually. Um, uh, about 1909, Henry Flagler bought, bought the island, uh, but did not put it in his name, put it into, I can't think of, uh, of the lady's name, but there is, um, and from there it was sold uh, several times and then purchased by the, by the state in 1970, I believe, and, and then became a state park in 1971. Anyone? What's your... I just remember something 76 and I can't remember. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, by that point, it, 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 it had become a, a it, it become state owned. Like Live and Vita Key had been bought for the state and kind of gifted to, to the state. Actually, the, the state bought it, Fred. Uh, the Nature Conservancy wasn't able to raise enough money. Okay, great, all right. They contributed to the Department of Natural Resources well, in agreement with, with DNR in order to buy it. But the deal ended up including Shell Key and I think Indian Key, although it wasn't part it wasn't part of the sale, it was acquired at the same time. That would make sense. They both became state parks at the same time. <clears throat> yeah. Excellent. I, I, I remember getting criticized a lot. It's not a state park. It's a state botanical preserve. <laughs> well, they originally wanted to leave it alone entirely and call it a wilderness area, but it turns out that there's a minimum acreage and Ligon Vitae Key was nowhere near it. Wow. So they invented a new category for it. Oh, excellent. Mary, welcome. I see you have joined us. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask away or Robert or, or uh, uh, Brad. Yes. Uh, I think I had asked you to, it, you know, let's say back like in the late 1800s, um, early 1900s, what would you say the majority of the people were doing in the Florida Keys? Were they, were, I mean, was tourism, did, was anybody involved in tourism at that time? Or were they just working on plantations? Were they just simply living there as a family? What were they doing? Late 1800s? Yes. Wreckers. Um, well, Key West, you know, had, was a very large, successful, had, you know, had, had become the richest city per capita, you know, in, in, the, in the state, at one point, perhaps even the country based on, largely on the back of the wrecking industry. And by the late 1800s, the wrecking had been kind of a boom and bust industry. It had been, you know, as with the development of better charts, with the, 
with the lighthouses being constructed on the reef line, with the ships moving from from just sailing ships to you know to uh, more you know more, more reliable modes of you know steamships and things like that, wrecking became less and less profitable, less and less you know a uh, a, um, a a way to make a living. But there were other industries, you know, sponging, cigar making, all these, you know, kind of series of, of industries that were on Indian, that were on Key West. And Key West was always the primary place. The population um, of the Upper Keys, let's say in 1870, uh, with the, uh, the 1870 census, um, there were like 140 people living in all of the Upper Keys. Uh, with the majority of those people living on Key Largo, 46 people living on Indian Key, 13 on, on Upper Matacumbi Key, and a lot of, in, in the Upper Keys was different than the Lower Keys. Like in the Upper Keys, largely a, a lot of farming was going on. That was a primary industry. Um, and, but in the Lower Keys, or, or Key West, um, that was much more, there was much more industry because that was a much more active, that, that was a port of entry, many more ships coming and going. So yeah, the first so there were hotels working and restaurants and brothels and saloons and and merchants and mercantiles. So that was more of a more of a regular town that was that was going down there. So the, it was largely based off of off of the sea because it was all ships coming in prior to, prior to, to the arrival of Henry Flagler. You know, in 1912 with his railroad, but it was still a very active port, and so so there was, you know. You you had to have people who were who were working you know working the, the docks and the wharves and the warehouses people working the restaurants people working the hotels people working you know the the, the shops that, that were any you know that were any part of regular day to day living. Does that help? Yeah, um, Brad. When do you give me an estimate of when do you think that tourism became our main industry? in the Keys. Did that happen in the 50s, in the 60s, maybe the 70s? Tourism really, what really opened the island chain to tourism was the Overseas Highway, State Road 4A, which really connected um, the Upper Keys specifically, um, you know, and then with, with the inaugural you know, opening of the highway in 1828, you could drive from, from, from Miami to you know, to Lower Matacumbi Key with, you know, just using roads and bridges. And that's when we see a, a large influx of hotels and, and, and these roadside restaurants and these, you know, gas stations and those kind of things developing. Hey, Brad, can you also um, maybe touch a little bit on the post-depression era efforts by the federal government to promote the Keys as a tourism destination to save our area from bankruptcy? Absolutely. So, so as you know, the, the, the highway opens in, in 1928, um, but then, you know, the, the depression comes in and the train is not bringing people to Key West and to other, you know, other areas of, of the Keys in quite the numbers that people wanted them to. So part of the, part of the, uh, when, fair, so when Roosevelt becomes elected, he has the New Deal, he wants to you know put America back to work, and he you know he um, uh, creates a FARA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, and FARA's Florida uh, consider you know uh, overseer or person with, with a guy named Julia Stone, who loved Key West and who headquartered in Key West, and he saw Key West potential as a tourist destination in the 1930s, and he wanted to spruce up. Key West. So he, you know, he had people painting houses and cleaning, be and cleaning up, you know, and, and, and planting gardens and cleaning up the beaches and, and, and creating houses that would be able to, to, uh, to house visitors to the island. Also, the Key West Aquarium was one of these things that were built in Key West specifically to draw tourists down to the island. Of course, that, you know, there's a big hiccup in that when uh, 1935, well, the one big hiccup in that is that the highway is incomplete and runs only to Lower Matacumbi Key. At Lower Matacumbi Key, people were forced to uh, 
sure. board a automobile ferry, which was a four hour drive from Lower Matacombe to No Name Key. At No Name Key, we disembark and continued to Key West, but it was very inconvenient. And Stone realized this and wanted to create a series of solid bridges that would eliminate the, this need for the automobile ferries and allow for easier, uh, easier, you know, an easier way to reach Key West that would bring more tourists, more visitors to the island. Which is why the, um, which is, and actually it was Stone who suggests at this point, you know, there's all these veterans who are, have marched across the country and the, the cause a big problem, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., these bonus marchers. And uh, Stone suggests, why don't we have these, those, those guys come down and help build these, these bridge products, these bridge, bridge uh, projects, which was, you know, which was a good idea. And that's when these uh, hundreds of World War I veterans are brought to the, brought to the uh, uh, to, uh, upper Matacombe, lower Matacombe Key, or lower Matacombe Key to begin these, these bridge building, you know, these br bridge building projects. And then of course, in 1935 Labor Day hurricane comes and Monroe County is bankrupt at this point. The, uh, the railroad's bankrupt at this point. Um, or, or soon to be bankrupt, the state's bankrupt, and after the hurricane destroys 40 miles of railroad track, um, it's decided that rather than, you know, the Florida East Coast Railway didn't want to rebuild, they in, in, instead sold their right-of-way to uh, for $640,000 plus some tax relief, and the, and the railroad right-of-way becomes kind of the, uh, becomes Kind of an extension of the of the overseas highway. Some of the old railroad bridges, which were built very well, withstood the hurricane and were widened to accommodate uh, to accommodate uh, uh, automobile traffic. And in 1938, the second incarnation of the overseas highway opens up. And by now, so now you can drive. You can get in your car in Miami and drive all the way down to to uh, 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 Key West. But there's all also, this other thing that's going on called fishing that begin that, that has already uh, the islands have already become you know become known, especially the Upper Keys, and Long Key Fishing Camp, for instance, which is touted nationally by Zane Gray, who was there every year from 1909, I think, to 1926, and then periodically after that. Um, but he you know writes about all, all the great fishing in, in, in the Keys, and then uh, so fishing also becomes a great lure, and you know. It, and a great draw for people to come down. So that so the, there's a, a lot of mix of industries and things going on and fishing. Uh, you know, going back to you know, going back to uh, to uh, Ellen's question earlier about industry, turtling and fishing were also big industries as well. Yeah. Ellen or Aaron, did I answer that? that Good. Especially? Did we? Do I remember correctly that we had an Arthur Rothstein exhibit here a few years ago, Brad? A photo exhibit. We did. He was hired by the. I believe the Farm Bureau, part of this program, um, to photograph, to photo, to go around to all of American kind of photograph. And he was the one who was sent down to the Florida Keys, 1937, 1938, and took a lot of these really iconic pictures of, of, of the area. Most of them are in Key West. And um, you'll see a lot of uh, really beautiful, he, um, I don't, I can't think of my Rothstein uh, history off the top of my head. He was an amazing photographer, did some really beautiful work. His daughter now kind of represents uh, and promotes a lot of his work. But, um, and he took some, some really iconic pictures of um, Laura Matacombe Key and some mackerel fishing there, and also of, uh, of, of the Hurricane Monument that was built in 19, it had just been built in 1937. But he photographed a lot, a lot of everyday living, you know, some of the cigar cigar shops and, and, and the barbershop, you know, and, and people drinking coffee. <coughs> and he was one of just many um, artists that was kind of imported into the Florida Keys as a part of this WPA beautification project to try and attract more tourism. And in addition to artists who would, you know, do things like paint murals on public places, um, you know, many artists were hired to create um, promotional advertising and do drawings for postcards and things like that. So it, um, it not just the Florida Keys, but all, all around the country. That was part of the, that was part of the program of the process of, of putting Americans back to work. And there was, you know, 
there's uh, you know, so so writers and, and artists, yes, and all, all these other people who were, you know, trying to recreate, you know, life as as it was prior, you know, kind of prior to the uh, trying to, to dig dig the country out, out of this Great Depression. Brad, when, when um, remember the exhibit we had about the highway artists? What, what years were they working? What, when they were doing their art? Aaron, I believe now is, is Googling that as we speak. I'm gonna say, <laughs> I'm gonna say 60s and 70s. I'm not positive. Maybe back as far as the late 50s. Okay. These were, you know, gentlemen often of color who, uh, and, and, and there's a few, a, a few ladies who are who are mixing there with there who would just kind of stop and and they would by the road and these, these very quick paintings that you know and, and they would kind of go door to door trying to sell them and today man, if you have if you have some of those paintings they are really worth something there is a movie about them being produced currently um, I can't remember Gary I can't remember Gary's last name. Um, he did a, a really excellent book on, on the Highwaymen and was really helpful during our exhibit of that uh, of that um, uh, exhibit that we did of, of gathering people who had who had collections of these paintings. But there is a movie that's in production all about them. About I'm guessing 1850, late 1950s to 1970s. That's my that's my guess. Okay. Okay, thanks. Brad, could I ask you, oops. Oh, I am not muted. No, could I ask muted. you something though, again, a, a water related question. Mm -hmm. Could you talk for a moment about the history of the water pipe? Now the water, fresh water in the Florida Keys has always been, you know, a, a an issue. Um, it was actually the Navy who had <clears throat> who needed more water to who in, in the 19, uh, 1940s mid 1940s who who were inst instrumental in bringing the first pipe of fresh pipe of water from the from the mainland down to Key West they also did a lot of bridge projects in that time because mm -hmm. some of the bridges were not were not stable enough to support some of the heavy equipment that, that Key West needed that the Navy needed in Key West. So some of the older bridges were reconstructed to better support the military um, vehicles. And they, um, and, and part of the thing, one of the things they did was they installed the very first, they helped to install the, the very first pipeline that came down from, uh, from the mainland to, to Key West. I believe 1943 is when that opened. Thanks. I, I... I did not know. I was curious. I, I think it takes, even today, with all the, you know, lefts and rights that the water takes to fill all of the, um, it, it's a much more elaborate system of, of, uh, of, of pipes now, but it takes about two weeks for a drop of water to leave Homestead and, and, and reach Key West, even today. Who manages the system? The Florida Keys, or, or I'm sorry, the Florida Keys Aqueduct Authority. Thank I'm not you. Sure, if they manage it. Um, yes, that's correct. And they, um, the Aqueduct Authority has a well field, um, kind of west of Florida City, where they have um, a large plant there, and that's where everything originates from. Um, is the Aqueduct's plant in Florida City, and then it comes south from there. Slowly come slowly down from there. Is there only there. one? What? Is, is there only one pipe that comes down from the mainland? There is only one main pipe that comes down, which is why when it breaks in, in Key Largo, everyone's out of water all the way down to Key West. Um, now they do have like a reverse osmosis plant in Key West and storage capacity there in a small plant in Marathon so that if one part of the system goes down in an emergency situation, um, one of those backup systems can be activated. But um, like the, the RO plant in Key West, they're right now starting a project to um, 
it, it's old and it needs a lot of work. So they're redoing that and increasing its capacity, but it can't even come close to, um, you know, supplying enough water. Like after Irma, when the pipes were destroyed um, and Key West wasn't even getting a trickle of water, they could only turn the RO plant on for about two hours a day and run it. And that was the only water they had. And they were encouraging you not to um, flush your toilets if you didn't have to and things like that. And because you really didn't get a lot of water pressure even with that emergency um, system in place. But please feel free to wash your boat after you take it out. That, that, that's, that's important. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, and so if there's a crack, you know, some, if there's a crack at one point or, or a leak, they're able, I think, to kind of isolate parts parts of it now. But um, it's very, yeah. So it's same thing with the with the power. You know, if if a car hits a car hits a a, 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 a runs off the road and, and and hits one of the poles. Power lines. Not, power, yeah, it's out from you know, you know, for, for, for a good distance. And, and it's not a joke. We have had iguanas get into like the poles and I don't know, I don't know the technical terms for it, but they get where they're not supposed to be on those poles and we have had power outages caused by iguanas. I think the, the technical term is getting fried, frying. <laughs> <laughs> well, up here we have it all the time with squirrels. <laughs> This is uh, Tobin. So I, I lived overseas for about 16 years in Okinawa, Japan, and everything there is concrete, reinforced. They get about 21 uh, typhoons or hurricanes a year. They have, a, very similar to us, a lot of issues with water, a lot of issues with, uh, uh, you know, just enough water for the population. But uh, I'm really surprised at the uh, delicacy of our uh, electrical system. I was kind of I was interesting to, interested to see how many issues that we have uh, and the potential for a lot more. I was driving, I went down uh, last week, I drove, there's a flamingo on a uh, big torch key um, that's been hanging out, one flamingo kind of been hanging out by itself, which is really cool to see one in, one in um, you know, kind of in the wild. And as I was driving back, I noticed um, along part of the road, there were some deep trenches being built. I was wondering if they were considering, because you know, trying to put some of those uh, power lines under you know, underground to help eliminate some of the uh, no. That's yeah. aqueduct work on Grassy That's Key. Aqueduct. Okay. That's an aqueduct project. So, I, I, th thanks for clearing that up. I, I was curious because that I know, um, I know, like in my neighborhood, my house used to be connected to the hospital grid. When it was at the, at, at the old, which is you know underground, and and, and so uh, when hurricanes when hurricanes strike, my neighborhood used to not get cut off as as much. I know during Irma, Jill Miranda Baker, her house is on that on the current grid, I believe. So she did not lose power, for instance, during during Irma. I didn't either. What? I didn't either. You didn't either. Mm -mm. You were out I'd for like ten the days. Time. The refrigerator smelled awesome at the end. <laughs> But there are some parts, you know, that, that that are more subject to to outages than others. But it's still, yeah, it, you know, if if you're a squirrel up in, um, I'm not sure where Peter lives actually, um, but you know, squirrels or iguanas or, or you know, some guy on the side of the road who falls asleep or or otherwise, you know, uh, strikes a a power line, a power pole. It it really is amazing how how those dominoes fall and how one little thing can really affect such a large expanse of the island chain. That's just really part of, of what it's like to, to live in the Florida Keys. But it's a heck of a lot better than when my grandfather was growing up and you only had power for a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the evening. From like six to 10 or five to 10 in the morning. And then from, I think five or six to 10 at night and on weekends till, till midnight. And that was, you know, so you couldn't have a refrigerator because it didn't have enough power to last that. So in those days, people put the ice boxes. And you'd have to, you know, put the get the ice for the ice box to, to make sure and keep your uh, keep your uh, your uh, perishables fresh. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's it's still a lovely place to be, but there there are challenges that come with with all things. Did you have anything, Tobin? Thanks for joining us. Did you have a? Are, are you in the upper keys, lower keys? Where are you at? 
Uh, I'm actually uh, below mile marker zero. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so uh, we're, uh, I'm actually on uh, the military base here in uh, Truman Annex. Oh, excellent. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. I was looking forward to this. And my wife, Mary, is on here joining us from upstate New York on beautiful Lake Ontario. All right. Well, welcome, Mary. Thank you for joining us as well. Now I can put a, put a story behind that name. This is Mary on, on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, it's, the military history on Key West has been, is, is, you know, as old as, as old as anything in, in the Florida Keys during American occupation has, has, has been, you know, from, from, from uh, 1820, 1822, 1823 on, there, the military has, has been a part of, of Key West and, you know, ultimately a part of, of the Florida Keys. So that's probably one of the richest, richest, you know, histories in the Florida Keys is, the military history. All right, does anybody else have any questions? I have a current events question. I'm up in Arlington, Virginia, by the way. Okay. Right, right across the Potomac from um, a place I wish were further away. Uh, <laughs> but what's going on with the genetically engineered mosquitoes? Uh, have they I, been released? They have. Aaron will probably pipe in or chime in momentarily. They have been released. I know there's been lots of local discussion about them. Uh, I don't know much about them myself. Um, as far as my understanding is that they their job is to go mate with the female the right. males that are being released, and they mate with the females, and, and then the females be, you know become sterile. And can't, or I, I think it's something along those lines. I That's don't know exact. much about, I know this isn't the first time that this has come up, that they've released uh, engineered mosquitoes out, out, out into the wild. I was just wondering if the, if the process was actually underway, and it I sounds believe, like it is. Yeah, it, it was on the ballot box last year or two years ago? A couple of years ago, um, specific to a proposal to use Key Haven as a test site. Um, and Oxitec has, I believe, switched to a different um, potential testing location. And they're doing another round of uh, like public input. They've been um, doing some now virtually some different meetings and things like that on it. But I believe they just, they had already received their approval from the EPA and uh, they recently received their approval from the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to move forward with it. Thank you. They have not been released yet? I don't think they have. Because I, I know for a fact I've been seeing a lot about, um, you know, you still have time to share your public comments, that sort of thing. And, and usually that precedes the actual start of a project. Excellent. Thanks so much. But we do have cases of, of, of dengue, dengue, dengue fever. Dengue fever in Key Largo, <laughs> which is just another another uh, another thing to think about, you know, with, with everything else going on. How are how are your COVID numbers? Are they are they on the rise in the keys? Skyrocketing. Oh boy. I think between uh, March and June first, we're at one oh six. And between June first and today we're at over six fifty or around six fifty, I believe. Oh my, put up that roadblock again, get them all out. I saw something pop up today on that, uh, just about how they are gonna be closing the keys again. Ooh. There's a lot to talk about it. They need state support in order to do that. Is that I don't know if that's correct. I, I was, uh, Nancy Klingener was, uh, was uh, she's a, a reporter for, for WLRN. I know that uh, Roman Gastecki, Gastezi. Gastezi has been communicating with uh, the governor about that. I'm not sure what, I, there was a, there has been some discussion of, about the proposal or whatever, but it's, you know, it's, we'll, we will see what happens. Let me tell you, spending your day wrapped in PPEs, as I do, is no joke. And all these people that think it's a, a hoax, <clears throat> And come to work with me for one day. 
Absolutely, yeah. So this All isn't right. the first time we've contemplated a roadblock, is it, Brad? It is not. There was also one, uh, I believe 1982, there was a big roadblock that was implemented on, uh, in the Florida Keys about uh, uh, the top of the stretch in front of what is the last, uh, 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 the last saloon, what's it called, the last? Last, last, ch last, chance, last, chance, last chance saloon, yes. You know, when the, the government decided to in, 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 install what was basically a border checkpoint on American soil, which, uh, and the good people of, because getting into the Keys had not become an issue, and they were, you know, looking for illegal aliens, you know, that was the, the guise under which it was implemented. But when you stopped your car, they were looking in your glove compartment, everywhere else for illegal aliens to, uh, and um, so coming into the Keys was not an issue, but leaving the Keys uh, became quite, a, quite an event as, as traffic backed up, you know, from Florida City to Key Largo and, um, you know, which resulted in the formation of our beloved Conch Republic as what was really a publicity stunt by, um, by the mayor of Key West, Kevin Wardlow, who uh, tried to have an injunction, you know, up in Miami, went, visited the courthouse in Miami looking for an injunction to remove the, uh, the, the checkpoint and was ultimately failed. So uh, kind of as a publicity stunt and to bring, you know, more attention, uh, they, you know, they uh, said the next day, you know, to see them in Key West and they declared them, you know, they uh, seceded from the, uh, from the U.S. and became, and declared themselves the Conquer Republic. At which point they, there was a small, a small altercation involving uh, Cuban bread and, and the Navy, uh, a, a quick, a quick surrender, and then um, a plea for, a, uh, for several million dollars in, um, in, as, 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 reparations. Uh, rep reparations for the yeah, for what's going on, and still a great and still a great marketing marketing technique or marketing ploy, which is still relevant today, as we are the still and always will be the Conquer Republic. Well, I, I feel for you guys with uh, next week lobster season coming. Can you imagine the influx of people for that? Or is I it the not to? I, yes. I think the 29th and 30th, isn't it? It's the last Wednesday and Thursday of the month, I believe. Yeah, 29th and 30th. Ay, ay, ay. Absolutely. Good luck. All Good right. luck. Does anybody else have any, any questions before we uh, wrap up? Thanks again for sharing your cocktail hour with us, Brad. Thank, thank you, Brad. You. It's like talking to an encyclopedia. Well, Peter, thank you very much. That's high praise from you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. You guys have a, have a great night. Thanks for joining us from, uh, from, from Key West and from New York. And from Thank Oregon you. And from Minnesota and from and Wisconsin. Mary jo, you are. Mary jo, where are you at? New Jersey. Joyzy. In North Carolina. All right. And Wisconsin. Uh, yes, in Wisconsin. All right. You guys have a good night. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thanks.